Dr. Phil is telling it like it is and diagnosing the country. And the longtime TV host says unless Americans can come together and combat attacks on core values, the prognosis for the U.S. is not so good. The face of the soon-to-debut show, Dr. Phil Prime Time, is out with a new book, We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. The no-nonsense doctor, who has a Ph.D. in clinical psychology, is calling the book part of a long overdue conversation. Dr. Phil McGraw joins me now. Dr. Phil, thanks so much for joining us. So you're not exactly beating around the bush with this title of your new <laughs> book, We Have Got Issues. We've Got Issues. Tell me about the book. Well, uh, you're right. I'm not beating around the bush. We've got issues, how to stand strong for America's soul and sanity. And look, I, I love this country. I, I, I stand up when the flag goes by. I put my hand over my heart when the uh, national anthem plays. Uh, I love America. Um, and I love it enough to admit uh, that we've got issues. And I, I'm a incurable optimist. I truly am. So I feel like there are things that we can and, and should work on. And I, I think that family in America is under attack. Uh, the family unit is the backbone of any society. And I think we're seeing a, an erosion of family. And some of it is um, kind of unintended consequences of things like technology. Um, like smartphones and computers and the internet. And I think some of it is because uh, we've got certain factions pushing narratives and agendas in America that aren't in the best interest of families. Like, for example, uh, family um, uh, membership in churches has dropped below 50% in the first time in our country's history. And, you know, that was it's really not even so much about the religion as it is about the fact that that was a time when families got together at least once a week uh, and would spend time uh, just together and maybe go to dinner and talk and, you know, sp spend time and focused on uh, family issues and core values and that sort of thing. And that's really fallen by the wayside. And I hate to see that. Hmm. Look, you've had an enormously successful career, a wonderfully <clears throat> successful life. Why would you possibly want to wade into these controversial hot <clears throat> button issues, the culture wars? Uh, you know, you're right. I've, I've been very fortunate and I, I'm very proud of the work that we've done over the last 21 years. Uh, I've done over 3,500 uh, shows and had a career of you know, 15 years before that in uh, psychology and, and human functioning. But <clears throat> I, I got to a point where I looked around and I saw things changing, things going on in this country that really concerned me. And, you know, part of it is the rate of change. And how well we are adapting to or not adapting to that change. And I've always geared what I did to the questions that I was getting from our viewers. And those questions have changed across time. Like, for example, you know, think back to when uh, I first started, uh, the first text message had never been sent. Uh, I mean, technology just wasn't that big of a issue in our lives at that time. It, I mean, Seriously, people didn't even text back then. And then about 08, 09, we got bombarded with smartphones. And that changed everything. I think it was the biggest change since the Industrial Revolution. And I, I, it just, everything shifted. And sure enough, we saw the biggest spike in anxiety, depression, and loneliness among our young people. Just this huge mental health crisis in 09, 010, and it continued to get worse right up to COVID in 2020, where it really spiked even worse. Um, and I started seeing the questions I was getting from our viewers really shifting. It started to include social issues. It started to include uh, what's going on in schools. It started to include uh, a lot of things that went beyond just the nuclear family. And I, I knew I had to address those things because I didn't like what I was seeing happening in the country.
one of the issues that you mentioned just now, um, and in the book you say that activists with a quote-unquote woke agenda are on the attack and are pushing toxic ideologies in areas critical to both your personal life and our national life in every way they can. Uh, my question is, with so much going on in the world, with wars in the Middle East and Ukraine, crime, the economy, why the focus on cancel culture and what you call woke activism? Well, because I think it has an impact on where this country is going. For example, um, I think in our, our colleges, um, we don't seem to be focused on criti teaching critical thinking. Uh, we've got uh, so many uh, universities and colleges that are talking about um, a quality of outcome. Uh, you know, they used to be talking about a quality of opportunity, which I can get behind a hundred percent. We don't have a quality of opportunity in America, and we need to work harder on that. Uh, but now they're talking about a quality of outcome independent of the quality of input. And I think that is undermining the meritocracy that has made this country uh, what it is today. And if if you're telling people, look, if, if you've got one person that is sitting home in a beanbag eating Cheetos, and you got one person out just really working hard, and at the end of the week or the month or the year, they should have basically the same outcome. Uh, I, I think that is really undermining the, the core values of this country and. We're not only talking about it, we're actually doing it. We're paying people not to work. And that violates one of the most fundamental principles of psychology, which is don't reward behavior you don't want more of. Don't reward bad behavior. Don't pay people for what you don't want to see happening again and again and again. But yet we're doing that. And that really bothers me. Nothing against Cheetos, though, just for the record. <laughs> oh, I love Cheetos. I got the yellow fingers to prove it. <laughs> what role do you think that politicians play in this conversation? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a political voice, and I don't know enough about politics to speak intelligently about it. I think a lot of people that talk about it don't know enough about it to speak intelligently about it. I'm just willing to admit that. Um, but I think these are cultural issues. You know, somebody told me the other day, they said, you talk a lot about political issues. And I, I said, no, I think politicians talk a lot about cultural issues. Um, I think it's the other way around. And I, I really think, I, I don't see a whole lot of differences between political parties. And I think we're safest uh, when we're in gridlock. It, it's when I see the, the presidency uh, the House and the Senate, all of one party, I get real nervous because now they can really do some damage. I think as long as we got the president from one party and at least the House or the Senate from another party, I feel pretty safe because they're, they're just going to be gridlocked. They can't do a lot of damage. Um, but uh, I, I, I just don't think that we've got people in charge of problem solving that are really interested in solving problems in this country. And I think that's not a very smart thing to do on our part. Um, I, I, we got a $35 trillion debt uh, deficit and it's going up. And I don't, you know, I grew up really poor and, you know, there's a big jump between what one guy's got in his pocket and the government's uh, economics. But when you boil it right down, is it really all that different? You know, we're spending money we don't have, and so we just keep printing it. Uh, that just makes all the money that we've worked for worth less. And people don't really understand that sometimes. I think it's silently printed behind closed doors, and people don't realize when they print up another trillion dollars, uh, your money just became worth less. And that's like another tax, and you can't buy as much with it. And you know, it costs $11,000 more to buy the same things today that you bought at the, at the end of 21. And that, to me, is something that nobody's talking about. They, you know, they talk about inflation, they talk about economics, but they don't 
really get down to what it really means to the family. And people need to be talking about that. They need to get people's attention and maybe they'll do something different. I get when you're saying you're not really into politics, you think this is more of a cultural issue, but my question would be, aren't the two kind of intertwined at this point? Um, in the book, um, <clears throat> you mention former President Trump just one time. He gets a single uh, mention in a reference to uh, his historically low polling numbers along with President Biden. Can you unify America, as your intention uh, is in the book, without mentioning former President Trump? Well, you know, I, I think this country is a whole lot bigger than one personality. And I, I know right now we're in a presidential election year and so everybody's lining up, but I, I have people ask me about uh, party politics uh, an awful lot. And anytime I talk to somebody about it, I, I say, you know what, I'm, I'm willing to talk to you about it, but um, I, I'm not Republican or, or Democrat. And if you want to talk about it, the first thing I want to do is let's get out a pen and a pad and let's talk about the things that we agree on. We can talk about our differences here in a minute. We'll have plenty of time for that. But first, let's talk about everything we agree on. And, you know, you would be astounded at how shocked people are when they look at that list of everything that these divided polar opposites agree on. For example, we all agree that we want a safer America. We all agree that we want our children to grow up in a country that was at least as good, if not better, than the one we grew up in. We all agree that we want to be secure economically and food-wise and atmospherically. We, we all agree on a lot of really core things that we want, and our difference is to get down to just strategically how do we achieve that? But value-wise, we have an awful lot in common, no matter how divisive we may be on certain issues. When it gets down to it, we all seem to kind of want the same things. You said you're not a Democrat or a Republican. I've read before you've said you've stayed non-political because you see idiocy on both sides of the aisle um, and that you're not a big fan of President Trump or former uh, former President Trump or President Biden. If you could wave a magic wand uh, and create a presidential candidate for 2024, who would that person be? You know, I, I think it would be someone that didn't have... Um, a desire to be elected to a second term. I think it would be someone that um, really um, had a, a focus on families in America and how well they were doing uh, month to month. I think they would be someone that uh, was pro-immigration, uh, but also pro-border control. Uh, I, I think they would be someone that um, was really interested in listening to what the people were concerned about in their day-to-day -day lives. It's almost impossible for the president of the United States to not live in a bubble uh, because we have to protect them so much and we have to uh, have so many filters uh, that everything has to go through. It's hard. Uh, I, I wouldn't take that job for all the money in the world. Uh, and so I'm, I'm slow to criticize the specific individuals that do that job because I, I can't even imagine how difficult it is to stay in touch with the people that you're supposedly representing. But I, I, I think that I, I would hope to get someone that was more interested in doing the job than in getting reelected to do the job. And I, I think for that reason, I would want somebody that was going to get in there and do the best they could and then go turn it over to somebody else. President Biden is 81 years old. Donald Trump, 77 years old. Are you concerned by the age question? Uh, I'm concerned by functionality. And um, I, I think you I, I think when you get to that age, you sure need to look at who's standing behind them in the vice president's role. And, you know, I, I think uh, I think President Biden uh, has come under a lot of scrutiny for 
his cognitive agility. And I mean, who can, who can hold that against him? He, he does, he can't control his aging process. Um, and, you know, has he dropped some steps? I, I'm, I'm sure he has. That's, that seemed really old. 81 seemed really old until lately. <laughs> the, the older I get, the younger that seems. Uh, but I, I don't think it's a chronological age. I think it has to do with um, your level of functioning. And I think it's, it's real difficult uh, to assess you know, whether somebody even wants to be in that job. Because I think once you get in it, uh, your party needs you to, it, incumbency is really powerful. So I, I, I don't know whether he wants that job or whether he doesn't, but I think a lot of people want him to stay in that job because of the incumbency power that comes with the job. But uh, I think both of them, um, you know, they, they certainly are probably past their prime functioning. If we just look at the aging curve, that's got to be true, right? They can't be uh, as effective as they might have been uh, 20 years ago. You just hope the wisdom offsets uh, the cognitive agility that they might not have and that they surround themselves with trusted people that help them along the way. You've said before that President Biden should go ahead and take a cognitive test. Would you call on all White House hopefuls to do that? Well, I, you know, I, I think anybody that's going to get in a leadership position, I mean, pilots are required to do it. I, I wouldn't want to get on an airliner if somebody hadn't screened the pilot that was up there. I don't know. Would you? Um, I, I think if you're in a, a important position, I, I think you have to uh, demonstrate some fittedness for it. Um, and, you know, that's not a rule of, of law right now. And until it is, um, I, I don't think uh, anyone should be compelled to do so. I think uh, I don't think it would change anybody's mind if he did it. Um, it might change his, but I don't think it would change anybody else's. I think confirmation bias is so powerful that people have probably made up their minds about it one way or the other. Um, but uh, I, I think both of them, uh, if, if one does it, I think the other one should do it for sure. Another well-known TV doctor, Dr. Mehmet Oz, attempted to trade medicine for politics. He, of course, ran against uh, John Fetterman for the Pennsylvania Senate seat in 2022. Would you consider getting into politics? No, not a chance. Like I said, I, I don't know enough about it. And I, I don't think that um, some people might consider that a plus. But I think particularly in this day and time when we're a, a global economy and uh, really global in every aspect. Uh, I don't know that that's a gap that could be closed if this isn't something that you've uh, steeped yourself in along the way. Um, I feel competent in the lane I'm in. Um, you know, that's why I, I wrote the book, We've Got Issues, How to Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity, which deals with social issues, deals with cultural issues. I've spent the last 45 years uh, in this lane and in this arena, and, and I, f I feel very comfortable in that. But you start talking to me about talking to me about geopolitics and all the things that go into that, and uh, I'm I'm a neophyte. I, I don't think I would be competent to do that. You're no stranger to Capitol Hill, though. You've been to Washington before. Do you plan on talking with lawmakers about some of the issues that you write about in this book? I certainly do, and every time I've been there, I've been invited as a as a content expert to talk about a, a specific issue, and I'm always uh, very proud to address you know bipartisan committees on such things as uh, education and drug addiction and domestic violence and things that I have spent my career devoted to, and I've I've always been very proud to do that and very flattered to be asked and. Uh, I feel like it's had an impact across time, and I always look forward to that when I'm asked, and I've never said no. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about social media, something that you touch on in the book quite extensively. The House recently passed a bill, as you know, that could uh, ban TikTok. You said in the book that you don't want to let TikTok get within a country mile of your child's phone. So I'm assuming you would welcome a ban on TikTok? Well, look, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the government getting involved any more than they have to. I, I think the I think this is a parent issue and you know the problems that I see right now um, as I said when when the smartphone became an extension of our hands and our, our average person in America right now checks their phone 352 times a day and the younger you are the more you check your phone and it's just you know all based on you know fear of missing out on something um and there's a significant portion of people who get a hundred percent of their news from TikTok. that's worrisome to me and as a parent I, I would be very worried about that and so much of that information is programmed so much of it is is curated by the people putting it on there um I think the best approach is to make sure that your teen uh, knows exactly what's happening on these social media platforms, not just TikTok, but Instagram and and others, because I don't, you know, the teen years are the years that are just evolutionary wise, kids get pretty rebellious and start kind of pushing back and don't like being uh, told what to do, don't like being manipulated by authority. I think parents need to understand what's going on and make sure their teens do, because I don't think their teens would like that if they really understood what was happening. And I think the best control for that comes from within the family, not from outside by the government. And I, I think, uh, you know, I've got grandkids that are coming up into that age and their parents are very much in control of how much time they spend there. And, uh, and what they understand about it. And I think that's where it needs to start is with the family, not with the government. One final lighter question for you. On your former daytime <laughs> TV show, you tackled broken families, relationships, finances. We have a very fractured Congress. Uh, if you had warring Democrats, warring Republicans on your show, how would you get them to hug it out by the end of your show? You know, the first thing I would have them do, that is such a great question. First thing I would have them do is spend some time making eye contact, looking at each other without saying a single word, because we don't spend enough time regarding each other as human beings. And I think if you have to stand in front of somebody and look them in the eye, and regard them as human beings, not as opponents, not as a Democrat or a Republican, not as somebody that is your adversary, but as a human being that gets up just the same as you do every day, that has a mother and a father that loves them, has children at home that are proud of them, has challenges with somebody in their family that maybe is fighting a disease, has difficult siblings, whatever, that face a lot of the same things that you do, and you consider that that's a human being that with whom you share great commonality, I, it, it's kind of like keyboard bullies say a lot of things when they don't have to deal with somebody personally. Road rage people scream things through a, a rolled up window uh, that they would never say to somebody in an elevator. We don't regard each other enough as human beings. And if we would stop and take the time to connect as human beings, I think it would change the face of things in a fast, fast hurry. The book is We've Got Issues. Dr. Phil McGraw, thanks so much for joining us.